want to also discuss a little bit why some people think they need to want a G server all the time or need to write them. Uh, we're going to discuss a little bit. And in the end, I want to discuss a little bit uh, which thing you have to consider or we have to have to think about before writing your J server. And that's it. Okay. Uh, I'm uh, Ulysses Almeida. I'm an Elixir developer in the Coin Game group. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, you can reach me to GitHub or Twitter with Ulysses Almeida. Uh, I'm from here. You know this place? Yeah. You, you know it? Oh, what? <laughs> from that city? I come from Brazil. If you don't know where Brazil is, it's like there's Sao Paulo there, south of Brazil, southeast. It's like this, <laughs> yeah. like eleven thousand kilometers. <laughs> Just for you, crazy traveler. <laughs> Actually, I'm joking. I'm living in Estonia now. <laughs> <laughs> now I live in Italy. Yes, like one town, like less, way more accessible <laughs> than 11,000 kilometers. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm Brazilian. I came from Brazil. If you don't know, Elixir was built by Brazilians. Like, it was created by Brazil in a company called Botafogo Tech. I worked there for five years. I could see Elixir as a baby growing up and become a kid. Today, like a teenager. <laughs> and then, why I moved to Tallinn? Uh, of course, one was one of the main reasons was job. <laughs> like the other thing that's very good is low rating. Like this rating is not expensive. Like it's a capital city, but still the rating price is like it's, it's fair. Like it's, it's not bad. And also, if you live there and you, know, you are registered as a resident, you can have free transportation, public transportation. It's pretty cool, like you can save a lot of money with that. And also the Estonia, like low bureaucracy, like you, I could get, I could get my uh, residence permission really easy, like no bureaucracy, just bring my passport, like, okay, get to, get to, there's your residence. It took two, two months, but <laughs> it was pretty really easy. Uh, it's safe, very safe, like compared to Brazil, but it's very safe. <laughs> <laughs> if you watch some movies about Brazil, you will see, and I guess it's, it's pretty safe. <laughs> uh, okay, the, the taxes also is not that big, I think it's 21% in your salaries. Like if you look at Germany, like 50% or Sweden, something like that, it's, it's very low taxes, then it's pretty good, okay? And also accessible travels, like now I can travel around Europe more easier than. <laughs> From Brazil, also the, the flight ticket is more cheap, way cheaper here in uh, close to Europe. Like it's really good. And okay, but of course, not everything is like for South America. Like not everything is good, or maybe uh, not bad, but it's different for me. <laughs> it's, it's a challenge for me. Like one thing is like cold and dark, like especially in the winters, <laughs> like six hours of sunlight, <laughs> and everything is and, like like the worst. Uh, winter in Brazil is like five degrees or seven degrees plus plus <laughs> now like minus twenty like really <laughs> minus twenty like it's very challenging for me now. But also in Brazil we speak Portuguese and Spanish is, is common and English is also common. But in Estonia it's the first language. <laughs> it's quite challenging. Tere 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 because. <laughs> And other, the other challenge is like the second language is Russian. <laughs> but okay, but Tali is a capital. Uh, many people, especially the young people, they speak in English. Then it was not that challenge for me, but it's still like uh, quite a challenge. And also, the culture is a little bit different. Usually, Brazilians are more like hugs, kisses. In the, <laughs> in the Nordic culture, is more no, like, like, what, what do you even do? <laughs> <laughs> do away from me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And also, I wrote a book. Uh, if you, you can buy it <laughs> in the private bookshelf or in in the Amazon, it's about uh, it's a basic uh, of functional programming. It's like if you are a Elixir developer and a functional, functional programmer developer, this book is not for you. Okay, so if you are starting, if you are learning, this book is maybe it can be for you. And 
It's like you can have a 25% of this course. I put wrong that as a typo, it's not 20, <laughs> 25. Uh, you can use this coupon, this code in the Project uh, Publisher uh, website. And I wrote this book. Yes, and I work in CoinGear. I always say that, but yeah, say yeah. It again. You can talk with Natalie and Ira. Ira, Ira, And you can talk if you want. Or talk with me or Eduardo if you have interest to work there. Uh, we have openings, a lot of openings in Kiev and in Tallinn. In Kiev, no. No, 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 Kiev than Tallinn. <laughs> <laughs> you can uh, Tallinn. Same. They know better than me about the openings. Uh, and okay, gambling, uh, crypto, you think like, oh, evil guys, like doing stuff. <laughs> no, it's not, don't feel like that. Like, feel like an entertainment company, feel like it's a normal startup. Like, it's not like a bunch of evil guys in a round table, like, oh, let's maybe just hurt, but <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> no, it's really, it's really good to work there, feel good. And then it's just entertainment. And we have a lot of rules and that we have to follow, like to be fair in the game, then it's pretty cool. And if you're interested, okay, let's go back to the servers. <laughs> <laughs> Stop introduction. Uh, I, I, I tweet about uh, asking people what what's the definition of uh, what is Jake server is, and uh, in max seven words, and I got some answers. One answer that Jake server is a green thread with a priority query. Green thread, query. Yes, there's one definition. Other definition is, is abstraction for processing messages and keeping state. Then abstraction process messages, keep a state. Is what there is like whatever object wants to be, like all the objects wants to be. Like <laughs> Other answer like something that could have a better name. That's <laughs> <laughs> a good definition too. <laughs> okay. Okay, J7 is abstraction on top of Erlang process. Like it's useful for to have a client server uh, relationship. Like you have a client, you have a server, then you might use a gen server that the ser the server name came from and gen is generic, like it's very uh, it's it's an abstraction, but it's still a low level abstraction on top of process. Uh, it's useful for to keep a state. Yes, it's really true. <laughs> like you have a, a centralized state and you want to manage it, you want to have a safe operations under the state, then you can use a, this. Now you also can execute some code asynchronously with handle cast callbacks. And also you can have a, a synchronous response with handle call callbacks. And also, you have like some, like from the framework, or OTP framework, you can have some error tracing, reporting. Also, it's a process you can supervise in your application tree. And that, this is what JS server is for. There are many shades of JS server. Like, usually, it's, you can, instead of using JS server directly, Okay, you can use an agent or you can use a task, task supervisor, supervisors, dynamic supervisors, that change stages. There are a lot of libraries that create uh, abstractions on top of server. Like, the, maybe you might not need to use a server. Maybe you have these other abstractions that uh, it's more suitable to your needs. Mm -hmm. Okay, then how a server works? Okay, imagine you have a server. I'll call this populator server. And you have a process, a client, I will call it baby. Because, <laughs> yeah, an example. And how it works, like, the client, the baby, wants to talk with the server, and they, you, you might want some, send some message, like, how, how much is one plus one? Then it take that message, put, and prepare a message with that question, and send to the server. The server will take that message and will open. Yeah, oh, from baby, I have this uh, this request one plus one. Then it will calculate. Like, oh, it's two. Then we will put this result in a message and we will send back to the baby. 
and then they do open, and from this dead server, I have this answer. It's basically basically how uh, J J server communication works. Right, let's see. I'll, I'll go there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll show this code. <laughs> Worst idea, right? I have a life. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always. <laughs> okay. Can you see the code? Yep. Uh, it's white background, white team. I used to program in a dark team, but I think for a presentation, the contrast is better. <laughs> I'm not that evil. <laughs> white team. Okay. Then we have a, a business module with calculator, which we do the last sum. And that's it. Like Usually we separate. The business logic from the chain server. Like chain server is more for about uh, runtime properties, not about business logic. Then we this then this this module is the business logic. Then we have the chain server, like our calculator server. I'm using this abstraction. You can read the documentation. I will not explain too much. But the important part here, like we have the, the interface to call with this server that we will. Use this chain server call that will send a message to our uh, callback. And in the callback, this head of call, and we receive that message. That the message is a sum A and B. Then I'm pattern matching that message with sum A and B. I will call my business uh, model uh, function here, like sum. And I will reply to the client the result. Like the sum, you will calculate. A and B, and you can, uh, CC is a handle call. If you remember, handle call is for synchronous uh, calls, like I'm, I'm waiting for a, the client is waiting for an answer. And yeah, that's it. Uh, you can check the details in the conditions. have a better explanation that I could provide. <laughs> but for the, the talk, that's what we are going to do. Then I'm starting the, that cyber. And then what we're going to do? We're going to Run a benchmark, right? We're going to run up. We we run like one thousand times. We will call some one plus plus one. You can check this library is benchy. It's pretty good. And to compare, we will call directly the business uh, model function. Like one call is through the server. One call is directly the business model. Like what? And we're gonna run with twelve babies, twelve clients, right? We have twelve clients concurrent and executing this. And there is some warm up. I don't know what is it. <laughs> so we will run for ten seconds. I think this warm up will run a little bit to warm up the memory, the processor, something like that. I don't know how important it is, but it's important. Okay. Let's run this. Okay, I will run it to take some time, like 30 seconds. What? Ah, so this. It's now best benchmarking our business module. You want to tell a story? <laughs> it's working, right? Now <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's benchmarking the server. There's some magic happens. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just split the results. <laughs> okay, oh. we get the results. And we can see that our, if we compare, our calculator server with a chain server, it was 253 times slower than our business model. And our calculator server took like 10 times more, almost 10 times more memory. Like right now, let's go back here. Oh, maybe I should have recorded. What? <laughs> like what? Like the server was slower. Like the 
if I use JS server, I make my application slower. Like, like if you maybe you, like if you already know JS servers, you know uh, what's what JS server does. You like laughing right now? Ah, you know this is a JS server bottleneck. It's, it's a common mistake. If you don't know the JS servers might introduce a bottleneck your system, you the the right person there like, oh my god, what I have done? Like, I created JS server in my application. <laughs> And maybe I ruined my application. Yeah. Like, what? What? What the hell happened? Like, what? What the hell happened? Like, if we compare, like, a shita, like, it's uh, like a turtle is seventy-five times slower, <laughs> and like, Brazil is ten times bigger than Venezuela. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have uh, some <laughs> comparison. Like, what? Why? Okay, what happened? Like, let's see what happened. Like we said, uh, the JS server will receive messages and process it. Like, but one feature that it does, it will process one message message per time in, in order, in a QA. Like, it will take one message, uh, reply it, and then take another message, process it, reply it, take another message. Now if you have one baby uh, sending three messages, you it will put the three messages in line in the order in the order of our arrival and we'll process each one per time. And we have two babies, three babies, four babies, twelve babies, yeah. It's like like it it we this message QE creates a bottleneck. Like make the J servers go create like it takes it becomes very slow. And why then the uh, without JS server, like calling directly the business module function, work better. Because let's say we have all this baby, like if I'm calling directly the, the business module, I'm not calling the JS server. You know, I just take the calculator, improve, and give to each baby like co calculate yourself. You know, like, <laughs> 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 what we did like when we remove the JS server, like we we distribute the the calculation, you know, like we distributed the, the, the processing. <laughs> uh, then why? Like why, why people want to put J servers in every place or they want to use J servers every time? Can we just play with functions, use functions and be happy? Like if J servers bring bring harm. Like if we see the Erlang OTP uh, features like uh, JS server process have a hierarchy. Um, you can with JS server you can have restarting strategies. It's pretty cool. Uh, you can also have concurrency with JS server, but right now it's not clear how this concurrency works because we put in the JS server it becomes slower. And JS server plays the central role. Uh, yeah, well, I said concurrency. Why? Why was not like when you have a JS server and you. What we did, we put this, uh, with, instead of, uh, and one thing that's very important for the server, like you want to centralize some state. But in the calculator server, we didn't have any state. Like, the one thing is like, one, uh, uh, one, oh, sorry, <laughs> one, one thing that our calculator server is not doing is modeling a state or, uh, or uh, controlling a state. This don't have any state. Then yeah. it was a wrong uh, strategy to use that JS server for calculator. Right. Uh, actually, the babies there, there were process like they were uh, uh, small JS server that was doing just uh, processing. Like they don't, didn't have any state. It was just calculating stuff. And also, JS server is very good to when you want to control. Uh, many tests running at the same time, or something like that. Also, it's very good to handle some uh, connection between servers, like external services. And also, if you need some graceful shutdown, like you hold some connection or hold some file, <coughs> and you want to shut down and you want to close it, you want to graceful. Like in our calculator server, was not doing anything like this. Yeah, yes. <laughs> don't have any chance. Then, uh, means 
Oracle Clade Server has no meaning because you're just doing math, like just uh, summing numbers. The one rule that you have always to remember, J server is not about code organization. You know, it's like it's about runtime properties, not about I want to separate my application here, I want to this is the users, this is the uh, products. No, it's not about it. J server is about runtime. Then why so elixirs developers want to use JSERVER all the time? I think maybe maybe some people have the feeling I, if I never wrote a, a Jing server in my life, maybe I'm not an Elixir developer, maybe I'm not a proper Elixir developer, maybe, I don't know. Maybe you'll be feared of missing this out, this thing. <laughs> when I've been working with Elixir for almost three years or four years, I can't say like I hardly often wrote or write Jing servers in my daily job. Like, it's very, very hard. I need to write one by myself. I most of the time, I wrote the G server in recruitment process, like <laughs> in tests. <laughs> I have to write it, <laughs> especially the Wingate one. You have to write it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, I delete actually unnecessary G servers in production. Like there's some G servers in live environments, uh, creating bottlenecks without necessity, and I have to delete G servers. Without. And also, I know some awesome developers. They never wrote a Jim server. Also, like they, they are very good Elixir developers, but they didn't have to write one. Okay. There's no shame about it. <laughs> if you never <laughs> wrote a Jim server, you can still be called an Elixir developer. <laughs> if you never wrote one, that's fine. Okay. And one of the reasons why you like you don't need to worry about writing one by yourself. Is because the ecosystem like get your core. Like if you see all the libraries in Elixir, they have J server. Like you're gonna use J server, but maybe you don't need to write one. Well, let's think about the web application. Let's think about the web application. We have users, robots, dogs, ducks, lions, <laughs> people. You know your Phoenix application, right? This is the Phoenix new Phoenix logo. <laughs> then probably your application is having a database connection, probably, usually. And also your application needs to talk of some legacy, some Java application, something like that. Maybe you have maybe your legacy also talks with another legacy, a PHP one, and you have to talk with a legacy too. <laughs> maybe you have all this scenario. Not just this just this scenario, maybe you have to uh, Handle some no secret storage or do some background tests and also have some operation that must be uh, serializable, like cannot happen at the same time. You have to put some QE and this to manage the state of this data, you have to run one per time. Uh, okay, let's see all this thing, how this ecosystem can get you covered. Like users in your web application, think about Phoenix. What we need? We need to handle multiple users. Connections, but we have a state, we have connections, we have to know if users connected or not. Uh, maybe other process in your application might send, need some send some messages to users, some data to users. Uh, and also, if a user disconnect or your application disconnect, one, we want to handle these connections gracefully. Right? Then, if we look at this checklist, it means we have to use Jing servers, right? Yes. But, before write your own JS server for this, uh, Phoenix and Cowboy and Web Servers handles that for you. You don't need to write the Jinx server for you. Uh, Phoenix guarantees that uh, every request you have a process, a Jinx server that will handle that for you. Like then you don't need to write. Uh, you can focus in the functional part of your system. Okay, uh, job programming. <laughs> then uh, your application, your database, right? You, database are external services. Basically, if you think as an abstraction, it's an external service. Then you have to handle this communication. Then also, probably you want to not overload your database, then you have a limited number of connections. You have some pool, you have some state that you need to handle. And this connection, you want to execute that concurrently, like, like not one per time. Like this, if I have a pool of 20 connections, I want the 20 connections working at, uh, concurrently or at the same time. And of course, if I 
need to disconnect, shut down my head. I want to close gracefully this. And of course, we want to servers, right? Like, <laughs> servers here. But we have already a library, database library called Ecto that does that for you. Like, the Ecto supports a pool of connections, and it handles uh, perfectly, correctly this. And the work here is also done. You don't need to write JSON server here. You can focus on business. And let's talk about app and other service. Maybe this more, not everything's done here, but what we need. We need to communicate through a network, like external service. And also, we might need to offer some pool to offer some back pressure. Like maybe we have a weak service behind, and maybe our legacy is not that powerful if we hand let Phoenix or users connect like crazy to make your this external service goes down. Then we need some uh, put some uh, back pressure on this. Then if you put some pool or back pressure, you have to guarantee that you it will run correctly. And of course, if I disconnect or something like that, I want to graceful handle this. And of course, change servers. But of course, there's also libraries that you can handle this for you. Like we have Hackney, Might, we have Tesla, HTTP Poison, and many libraries that can offer you these features. Uh, you can start to also see, you can start with the pool and see how it behaves in live, and if you need, you put or not. You can, and also, in this kind of systems, uh, it's very good like to check if how is the timeout will work because. You can flood your system, your message in Erlang if, it, if it, the, the legacy system is too slow. Then maybe it's good to have some uh, secret breakers if there's some libraries to do it too. Uh, then you choose some libraries and you can focus on your application features. Okay, those secret stories. Yes. No, not everything we're going to put in our SQL database. Some stuff can be stored somewhere else, like caching, some session, uh, or if you want to uh, easily to check which user are present your application. Uh, you have to think about, is this information like transient or persistent? Like, if I, my application goes down, it's fine the cache goes down together, or not? Maybe, maybe it's fine, maybe not. Okay, the cache goes down, and when my application put up, if we can warm up the cache again. Maybe it's fine. Maybe it's not. You have to think about the application. Also, it's good to think how <laughs> big it will be, like how how many data you're going to put there. Like, you know, think about are you going to write more or read more this kind of data? Like, it's a good question to this. Okay. And probably this data will be accessible by multiple processes. And of course, this server. So, you know, with ETS, right? <laughs> you see a lot about ETS. But think about about this thing. Like, let's say we have a Heroku infrastructure here. Everybody know Heroku? Oh, no. yeah. Yes, if you put an application there. But one thing that's very common in Heroku is that your nodes are independent. Like, they don't know about each other. You don't have a cluster. Like, a lot of people deploy like that. Like, your nodes don't talk with each other. Then let's say I put. Some users want that uh, put uh, put some cache in there in that node. Imagine this is a node application, and I spawn a new node. Like Heroku is very easy to spawn a new node. That node will not have that cache because if you use a chain server with a ETS table, like, that new node don't have that cache. Is it fine? Like if I spawn another node, also will not have that cache. It will not have that other cache. Then yeah, it will be a very consistent, but is it fine? Maybe it is, maybe it's not. <laughs> then <laughs> you have to think about it. Like uh, sometimes it's better uh, instead of write by yourself, some change server, use some <coughs> library called CacheX. Uh, it's basically behind of this, it's called there is a change server with ETS. <laughs> you can also change the if you don't want to store ETS, you can uh, you can put in some red redis or other place. Uh, in this kind of uh, no SQL storage or in memory storage, you have to think how your deploy will work. Like I said, like if you spawn a new node, 
this node don't know about the other node caching or data, it's, is it fine or not? Uh, also, if you shut down some node, all the in-memory data is there, you go down together, then you have to think, is it fine <laughs> or not? Yeah. Sometimes, if you work with Ruby on Rails or Node.js before, we use a lot of regis, and maybe it's right, the easy solution. Right? It's, it's a very pragmatic solution, and we work with our Elixir application too. You don't need to be too fancy and use Erlang stuff. <laughs> yeah, then discuss the right tool, uh, compare the trade-offs, talk with your team about what you are going to put there. We also, there's some, some operations that cannot happen at the same time. Let's see, I have a state, it's a wallet. I have these three bills. I have seven money here. And two babies want to be round money. But well, if we but they, if we sum there we have eight right and I cannot the two bits cannot have money here right? only one then we have to have a seri, seri, serial serial uh, operation here like yes yeah, so do one then do the next and then we have to manage the state like it's, it's, serialize this operation. Server, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe yes, maybe not. Like how, how I said before, maybe if you put this state in a Jinx server and you are running an environment like Heroku, one state will be there, the other state will be in your other node. And how you will handle that? You need some cluster, you these nodes have to talk with each other. And it the things get serious like, <laughs> when you doing this. And what happens if the good node goes down? Like how the how the node will know what will be the source of truth? The database you have to check the database. What is the source of truth? If some nodes going down, you have to think about the strategies. How uh, when there's a network partition, like if some node goes down, or some nodes cannot talk with each other to, to synchronize the state. Then sometimes just go make it simple. Use your database transactions or transaction logs. <laughs> it's way more easier than manage clusters and state uh, distributed states. It can simplify your life for a lot for, for a long time. Yeah, of course, always discuss with your team. Like if is everybody ready for this? Like if you want to put state in Jane servers and have cluster talking with each other. Don't stop with each other. Everybody's happy with that, and does everybody want to take this challenge or not? Yeah. Also, check the business uh, uh, like plan. Like maybe if you do this and distribute state in a cluster, maybe you you take more time to deliver a feature. Maybe business wants something delivered faster, and maybe you need just use your database database transactions and you'll be fine. Okay, background tests. Uh, some tests, when a uh, client stop with a server, you don't need to do in that uh, in that time. Like you don't need to uh, do in that cycle. Like you can do outside of that. Like sending some welcome email. Like if you use a refresh string, you don't need to send a welcome email in the same operation. Like you can send later push notifications, or maybe you have some schedule test, like something that. Uh, do every Monday or do every Friday. You know, not running in any user uh, server relation, uh, communication relationship. This thing we can spawn or uh, schedule schedule this background test. Uh, we need to run this concurrently. Like if I want to send 100 emails, I want to like, send all, almost at the same time, not one per, one by one. Uh, yeah, this looks like a good checklist for our Jane server, right? Like, we can use dynamic supervisors in tests. However, yeah. <laughs> uh, you have to think that Jane servers is an in memory story. Like, what happens if something fails? Like, it's fine. Like, if you don't send a welcome email, you'll be, you'll be the user upset. They're like, oh, I didn't receive it. <laughs> like, is it fine? 
Maybe yes, maybe yes, it's fine. Or maybe in a welcome email, we have some instructions, like important instructions. Then maybe it's not fine to be in memory. Like maybe you have to, to have some states there. And uh, yeah, maybe you you are sending email and you have a deployment and you have sh shut it down some node or something and you can lose this data. And you can use alternative solutions like HappyMQ or Redis or some persistent storage to fix these kind of problems. And also, there's, right now there's a lot of libraries like the one called Oban that use Postgres, Postgres as a to run jobs and and to have persistent jobs, like if something fails or not. You, have like, you also have to think about, like, if I send a, I'm, it's, is it fine if I send two emails, welcome emails or not? Like, like if we, for some reason I have some uh, issue and my assistant think that I didn't send an email, but I actually sent, is it fine to send two welcome emails or not? And some things that you have to think. Yeah, because we have team trade-offs. <laughs> find find the right to to your to your job. To the job. Okay, we talk about a lot of stuff here. Let's do uh, to finish here. Let's let's finish. <laughs> uh, then you can see there's a lot of libraries and elixir features and abstractions that is will be very hard to write your own JSON. Uh, and they still have more, like just just a few of them, but it's, there's more stuff that you can research and look. Uh, and JS servers are fundamental. Like all these tools, all these libraries, they use JS servers, like they use JS servers. But you don't need to write your own on JS servers. Like uh, they cover you, like you see frameworks, Phoenix, Ecto, libraries like Ecto or Open. Oh, oh, and users standard libraries, uh, standard modules too, uh, cover a lot of cases. Uh, and also, if you don't need to write your own JSON, doesn't mean you don't should not learn about JSON. You should learn. Uh, one thing is recruitment process. <laughs> We're going to have some tests there. <laughs> and also, if you know how JSON works, you can tune your configurations. Like since these libraries all use JSON. If you know how it works, you can uh, tune the configuration. You can, if you see some bug, you can uh, uh, work in the bug and send some pull requests to the library owner to fix some uh, issues. Uh, that is very good to, to learn about it. Uh, yeah, of course, like, like I said, if stuff goes wrong, you have to <laughs> debug and fix it. Uh, and of course, 95% of them you don't need to write a JS server, but that 5% you need to write one, and, and that knowledge will help you. Then keep learning, don't learn about it. Uh, OTP, JS server, supervisors, learn about it, it's very important. And remember that uh, benchmark for JS server in workplace will do more harm than, harm than good. <laughs> If you don't have a reason to write the JSON, don't, then don't write. Be happy if you don't write this module in functions. Uh, always uh, discuss your team, any new thing you do, gonna do or add, especially for Erlang, because a lot of DevOps, uh, Erlang OTP, this Erlang VM is new. Then just if you say, yeah, oh, let's use Erlang VM, DevOps will do that. What's going on? <laughs> so it's very really new, like for it's, it's an old technology, but new for people. <laughs> Most of the people. Uh, it's very different from Java, and, uh, and also there's no shame in never write. Have to need to write a JSON. There's no shame on it, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs>
inside of Erlang with the Chrome Dev syntax. But the library had uh, some issue that didn't work well in a cluster. Uh, in Coin Gaming, we are using an Erlang cluster. And it was very painful to fix that library. And then look at the code, like, eh, it's not that complicated. And then we end up writing our own G server <laughs> for that. <laughs> Uh, of course, there's a lot of issues like uh, until we get it right, <laughs> but now it's working well. It's working. It's now stable, running in production. But yeah, sometimes you need like sometimes you find an issue in some library. Sometimes you can fix the library. Sometimes you will spend a lot of time to fix the library. Then it's, it's easier to write some by yourself that will do the job and you can go. Along. Uh, thank you for great explanation. I, I got your point. Very interesting explanation, and it can be useful in my book. Convenient to thank you so much. And uh, just um, abstract question. Maybe, maybe did you face with uh, uh, code of RabbitMQ and uh, some interesting usage of Gen Server? Some modifications, uh, Gen Server two, so-called Gen Server two, which provide uh, priority queues abilities and and also very interesting for administrative callback for if you need to provide some administrative call, and very interesting patch server which provides um, patching abilities for login, for example. Can, can accumulate large pieces of data. So interesting, your point about that. Maybe you faced with it. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> what is the question was? Uh, it just was a comment. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so maybe you faced with it. Maybe you have experienced it. Uh, maybe interesting, uh, your point about abilities, uh, modifications of Gen Server. Sorry. Okay, uh, the first time I faced an issue with Gene Server or misimplementation of Gene Server. This one? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it was uh, a new Relic library. Like, you know, New Relic? Yes. Relic yeah. uh, it was a port from Python. <laughs> uh, yes. And we are using an like, e commerce library uh, co uh, software. Uh, and we have a Huge Kiwi, like message. Like, luckily, we have some metrics on top of that, like uh, not using New Relic, but uh, different kind of metrics. Like, and it could, we could see the message queuing up because there's some, like like I said in your server, it's serial. Then if you have a lot of message, it will queue a lot of message and it will hurt your system. And then everything was exploding in the system. Like, and it was like, oh no, Elixir is slow, like Elixir don't scale. <laughs> it was a very funny moment. And it's sad because we are we were consulted that time. Like <laughs> yeah, but we discovered the issue in the new lab and uh, new Relic library. We sent a PR, PR to the the owners of that library. But they took, took some time to fix, then we fork it and we <laughs> and we, uh, we start to use it. Yeah, but yeah, like uh, like a good thing to prevent this kind of issue or to see what's going on is have a good metrics like in your in your life system. If you're running Elixir or Erlang and you have no metrics, you have no like QA usage or memory usage, CPU usage, you have nothing, it's very dangerous. <laughs> you have you have to some put some monitoring there or metric otherwise you just have guessings. Oh I think it's the uh, database. Oh, I think it's the uh, I don't know, like some proxy. I think it's uh, nobody knows. But if you don't have metrics, metrics can uh, see the facts, like what what's going on. And, like without metrics, we could not ever find the the, the issue. Uh, and we fix it. You know, yeah. it comes still up. It's, it's still running to today. Guys. Girls, maybe do you have a question? Uh, <laughs> thank you for the talk. Uh, just one simple question about metrics. Uh, do you know uh, about any, uh, you know, 
complex tool uh, to just um, take in some metrics and you know because um, the, a lot of the time uh, team just you know implement uh, some metrics uh, for yourself mm -hmm. like use the library do you know any good library or tool for that yeah I think the elixir community took some time to work on it like three years ago two years ago we uh, we had nothing like people was bringing their own stuff but right now we have the telemetry library that came from Erlang. Now it's become the new standard. Now everybody's moving to that telemetry. And, and applications like New Relic, we have Abyssino and Scout. But I don't know if they are already integrated with telemetry. But this telemetry library is collect events and some measures, and you can publish some stats and put in Grafana or other DevOps too. And I think the telemetry is the new standard. Like. And Phoenix, the new newer version that will come, will will come with a uh, built in integrated with telemetry library. Like it will publish automatically some events to that, and you don't need to. to today you have to manage by yourself, you have to configure by yourself. But in the new Phoenix version, you don't need to. We have to delete if you put it in that number. <laughs> but if you 